Welcome to Lifeline Baptist Church on this Wednesday. Thank you for worshiping with us together as we study God's Word. We're going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and today we're in the Old Testament book of Nahum. So make sure that you have your Bibles open to the Old Testament book of Nahum. I'll give you just a few moments to find that. It's right behind Micah, and so please be mindful of that as we study together. While you're getting your Bible and opening to the book of Nahum, let me go over our prayer list. Wednesday night is our prayer meeting time and also Bible study time, and we do need to pray. I do believe in prayer. Matthew 18, 19 says, If two ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. We have many on our prayer list today, and I want to take the opportunity to share these. By the way, we have permission to share. If we do not have permission, we do not share, but we do have the permission to share these. Sharon Ogle needs a liver transplant, so please pray for her and pray for Ron as he cares for her. Brian Davis needs a kidney transplant. Kelly Taylor, a kidney transplant. Please, please pray for Bobby and Angela as they care for Brian and for Kelly. Paula Gafford deals with gastroparesis, and so let's continue to pray for her. Ernestine Spears is at Midtown Rehab. We need to continue to lift her up. Michael Terry continues to battle cancer, so please pray for him. Susie Bennett had surgery on Monday, or she has surgery on Monday, October 5th at UAMS. We want to pray uh, for Susie Bennett. Jim Romine, Ann's husband, needs our prayers. Teresa Kelly, Ann's daughter, has surgery tomorrow, and we want to lift her up in our prayers, as well as Alice Oliver, Miss uh, Ann's mother. We want to pray that God intervene in her, 103 years old and still going. And then Jimmy Hardiman, Sandy Rockwell's brother-in-law, COVID-19. Ray Moore, Wanda Ryden's brother-in-law, recuperating from COVID-19. And Bill Wall, Wanda Ryden's other brother-in-law. And then Peggy McKelvin has COVID, and she is in the Baptist Hospital in intensive care. Toby Burnett also has COVID-19, and she's in, uh, she's in isolation where she is at. And then Megan Dennis, continue to pray for her. Emma Jean Montgomery, Terry Jensen's mother, needs our prayers. And then uh, Jim Fowler, he's a minister that I grew up with. I love him dearly and pray for him that God will intervene in his life. He's recuperating from surgery. And then Teresa Carlton Hawk Harville, a friend of the church, uh, she needs prayers. Also today, a good friend of mine, Alan Elkins, who is a pastor in Northeast Arkansas, found out yesterday that he has COVID-19, and so we want to pray for him and pray that God intervene there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray together. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd be glorified in all that we say and do. Oh, how we love you. And we know that we love you because you first loved us. And I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you would be with these whose names have been called out, that you would intervene and work in their lives as only you can. We know that you are the great physician, the great doctor of all the ages, and we know that you teach us to pray. And God, we understand sickness and the connection to sin and sin nature, and we're sick of it all. And God, I pray that you'd work in spite of who we are in our lives, in our loved ones' lives, especially these that need liver transplants, kidney transplants. God, I pray that you take full hold. These that are battling cancer and these who have lost loved ones. God, I pray for the Dixon family and the loss of Brother Tom. And that service was yesterday. And two people prayed to receive Christ. Lord God, please move in our midst and bless us as your people. For we pray it in the mighty, bold name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as we come together, I want to remind you that this coming Sunday, we will have Sunday school at 930. We will be dismissing just a tad early so that we can come to the parking lot. It is our 108th birthday. And so everybody will be parking on the far side of the church and we will gather around the sign and we will ring our church bell Sunday morning at 1015. Even if you're not comfortable in coming into the sanctuary, please join us in the parking lot. We're going to pray. We're going to be socially distanced. We're going to have on our mask. We want to celebrate 108 years, and then we will be in the sanctuary for worship at 1030. So please join us. Be mindful of that. Also, we have a lot of things going on for October. Please be mindful of those things. We're getting ready for 2021. 
You may think, well, we're just now getting to October of 2020. Well, we've had our staff retreats, our committees and ministry teams have had their calendars and their budget sheets, and we are ready to present the vision and the strategy for Lifeline Baptist Church for 2021. And we will do so the last Sunday of this month in our regular quarterly business meeting. We will have our church council meeting the second Tuesday of October, the third Tuesday of October. We will host our business and community leaders luncheon. And we have a special guest coming to us from the University of Arkansas Medical Center. And they're going to be talking about COVID-19. You will not want to miss that business leaders luncheon. Today, as we study together, we're going to be in the Old Testament book of Nahum. I've read through the Old Testament book of Nahum, but let me say to you, this is the first time I've ever taught about the Old Testament book of Nahum. So please make sure that you have your Bibles open. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 in the Old Testament book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Let me say to you that Nahum is considered a minor prophet because of the three chapters in which he has written and it's not based upon the material or the words that he's written but how long the book is and so he is considered a minor prophet let's read together Nahum chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 the oracle of Nineveh now I will talk to you about or the word oracle and what that means in just a few moments and I will remind you that this is the second book in the Old Testament that has to deal with the city of Nineveh Please be mindful of that. The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elskashite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, in whirlwinds and in whirlwind and in storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence the world and all the inhabitants of it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, the, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he blows those who take, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Let's read verse 7 again. The Lord, this is Yahweh, pre-incarnate picture of Christ, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. I pray today that you take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not, I pray that by the time we're through with this study in Nahum, that you will learn to take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. I do not know your trouble. You do not know my trouble, but we are in trouble, and we are in the day of trouble, and we need the Lord to be a stronghold for us in the day of trouble. Let's talk about Nahum the book. When I'm looking at the book, there are several things that I want to answer. Number one, I want to know as much as I can about the individual uh, th that God used to write the book, in particular, the title, if his name is associated with the title. Then I want to know about the outline of the book. What does that look like? And then I want to know the key verses that are found within the book and what the, basically the book is about. Again, the individual that God used to write the book and the approximate date of writing so that I can have a handle of the Word of God. Timothy tells us that we are to handle the Word of God accurately and so we need to have a good handle on the word of god the title the uh, outline of the book the key verses of the book the individual that god used to write or individuals and the approximate date and so today we're in the old testament book of nahum let's talk about the title nahum in hebrew nahum means comfort 
Nahum means comfort. Now, in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, it was the comfort of Yahweh because you could see the ending of Nahum or the beginning and the ending of Nehemiah and you could see a phrase that would indicate Yahweh. And so Nehemiah means comfort is Yahweh or the comforter is Yahweh. Nahum means comfort itself. Now let me say just a little bit to you about how God used these individuals to write the books in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I do believe in a verbal plenary view that God breathed the word, as it says in Timothy, and that he chose the words in the Hebrew and the Greek, and then he gave those words to the individuals to write, just like thoughts come into your mind, thoughts came into their minds, and God gave them the word to write. And so I do also understand, just like in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we realize that we are far away, 2,020 years from the birth of Jesus Christ. When you look at the biblical uh, concept of creation from the time of creation to the time of Nahum to the time of the writing of Christ, some could say we're a few thousands of years, some say other, and I realize that. But regardless of where you think or how old you think we are, we're a long way from the book of Nahum. We're a long way from the birth of Christ. And Nahum was a long way from the things of God. And he is a sinner just like you and me. How do I know that? The Bible says in Romans 3.10, There are none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only human that never sinned is Jesus Christ. And so by the time we get to Nahum, we understand that his name means comfort. And as we think about Nahum, and I'll point this out later, I believe that Nahum is from the southern kingdom. He's from the uh, kingdom of Judah. And so he is representing the people of God, the things of God, the prophecy of God, and the kings that were doing what they thought that they should be doing in the presence of God. Were they perfect? No. But they weren't working against God like the kings of Israel at the time. And so Nahum... His name means comfort because he was going to comfort people. He was going to comfort the readers that he uh, had, and he was going to comfort the people of God, especially from the nation of Judah itself. And then even the Ninevites, they could find comfort in the fact that he's prophesying what's about to happen to us as a people group. What's about to happen to us as a people group? And so just as God, we're reminded of that in Nahum, God uh, never allows us to get by with sin. God is always going to punish sin. Sin is always going to make God angry, and God is going to take vengeance upon the sinner. And as we think about that, we're reminded that we need to be comforted in the fact that, yes, we are living in the latter days, and God's judgment is falling. I can take comfort from the fact that I know Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. These are days of trouble, but this is also a great day because the Lord has made it, and I will rejoice in it, as the psalmist says, and I can make it through my trouble. I can make it through my trouble. Say it with me. I can make it through my trouble with Jesus Christ. And so let's talk about Nahum's name. It means comfort, and it's shortened from Nehemiah, and we find it in Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, the oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. And so we know very little about Nahum. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but he was from uh, the people of the Elkishites. And so his Greek uh, name is Nahum, means comfort. Ultimately, his Latin name, Nahum, means comfort. Again, both the Greek, the Latin, and the Hebrew come from Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. Now, let's talk about the outline of the book. You have three chapters to outline, and so some would say, well, this is a, a quick read. Do not read the scripture just to say that you've read the scripture. Read the scripture so that you can apply it to your own life. Take the time to study it. Let me give you the outline of the book of Nahum. Number one, the number one part of the outline is God, which is the Hebrew word El, Nahum and Nineveh's oracle. And the word oracle is from the Hebrew word Massa, which means burden. 
And so in a lot of the older translations, it will say the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. And so we think about our burdens today. If you're burdened today, give that burden to Jesus. He died on the cross to take every one of our burdens. And so we think about this first part of the outline. God, uh, Nahum, and Nineveh's oracle or burdens, Nahum 1.1 through verse 15. Nahum 1 1 through verse 15. Nahum 1 1 through verse 15. Now notice that we get into the problem in verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes refuge on, or vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. I do not have to be vengeful. I do not have to take wrath out on anybody. In fact, somebody told me one day this week, well, they had a righteous anger. Be very cautious with what we refer to as righteous anger. I've never found anybody that could really exhibit righteous anger except for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is injustice in the world. There is injustice because there's sin and sin nature and sickness and sorrow and separation. But be very careful with anger and give that anger to God. There have been many times in my life that I didn't give that anger to God and realized at the end of the day, the only one that was concerned about my anger was Jeff. The only one that was going to be pricked with that anger was Jeff. Yes, I could contaminate the people around me, but vengeance belongs to God. Say that with me. Vengeance belongs to God. And so I try to stay away from anger. As a result of that, I try to stay away from the things that cause me to be angry, chaos and confusion and stress. If I were to ask you, are you stressed, hold up your hand. Probably everybody watching would hold up their hand. We are living in the days of trouble. If it's not a pandemic, then it's chaos and confusion. It's a lack of money. It's a lack of church. It's a lack of fellowship. You name it, we've dealt with it. I've dealt with 11, now 11, potential suicidal issues because of these days. Regardless of what the cause is, people are hurting, they are burdened, and these are days of trouble, but I know the one who holds the day, and his name is Jesus Christ. So the first part of this outline, God, Nahum, and Nineveh's burden. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. And then the second part of the outline is the Lord. Now notice the Old Testament word for God is El or Elohim. The word for Lord is Yahweh. Notice that the second part of the outline is the Lord, Nahum, and Nineveh's devastation. The Lord, Nahum, and Nineveh's devastation. We talked about Nineveh's burden. Now we're going to see the result of that in devastation. Nahum chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Nahum chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now, just like in chapter 1 and verse 2, we have the, the word God, in, ch in chapter 1, verse 2, uh, El, or Elohim, Lord, Yahweh. But notice in chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. Now notice the devastation comes from devastators. Devastators. And the key devastator that we deal with in our world today is Satan. Let me remind you, he is your enemy. Not this person, not that person, but Satan is our enemy. Please remember that. Now notice verse 2. For the Lord, this is Yahweh, will restore the splendor of Jacob. This phrase, splendor of Jacob, makes me think that Nahum is from the southern kingdom of Judah because the splendor of Jacob is going to be restored, and Jacob and his people, they were represented in the southern kingdom of Judah. And so that's the key reason that I think that Nahum is from the uh, kingdom of Judah. And as we think about the kingdom of Judah, think about the comparison between the splendor of Israel and the devastation. The, the splendor and devastation. Splendor and devastation. Say it with me. Splendor and devastation. In splendor, everything's going great. 
It's kind of like it's Christmas Day all the time. Everybody's happy. Everybody's in a good mood. Everybody's in a giving mood. Everybody's in a growing mood. Everybody's smiling. They're going to be courteous. They're going to be kind most of the time. I nodded. I know that it's not that way for every human being, but for the majority of us, even those that may not associate Christ and Christmas together, Christmas is a good time. Notice the splendor. Splendor is when we're going to all gather together in a place called heaven for a family reunion like no other family reunion. But notice the devastator and the devastation. And notice the connection between the burden, the devastator, and the devastation. As we think about that, God is going to have anger and wrath and vengeance upon sin and sinners. And if you think, well, I've gotten by with my sin, think again, it will not happen, or else Jesus would not have had to have left the portals of heaven to come to the earth, to die on a cross, to become your sin and mine, to be buried in a borrowed tomb, to be raised three days later, to walk on the earth for 40 days, to have over 500 witnesses bear that he was alive, just to go back to heaven so that he could come back for the church. We will never get by with sin. This world will never get by with sin. Our country will never get by with sin. Our state will never get by with sin. Our city will not get by with sin. No church will be able to get by with sin, and no Christian will be above sin. We will all be caught in our sin, and God's anger and wrath will be allowed to come upon us through devastation. And as we think about the devastator, that's his plan. You know why? Because John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Think about the devastator and the devastation that we're dealing with now. Think about our burden and our devastation. And then compare that to Satan and his job. To steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says at the end of John 10.10, 10, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly uh, Nahum calls it splendor. I want the splendor of God. I want the splendor of God. And so please notice the second part of this outline. The Lord, Nahum, and Nineveh's devastation. Nahum 2, uh, verses 1 through 13. And then the last part of our outline is the Lord of hosts, Nahum, and Nineveh's consumption. Notice this. The Lord of hosts, We've been introduced to God, El or Elohim, to the Lord Yahweh, now to the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, and then we begin to think about host, and it is Sebohwat, Sebohwat, the Lord of hosts, the God of all the ages. If you would, you could see the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the Lord of hosts, and how he works. The only way that I can have a relationship with God the Father is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And the only way that I experienced that 2,020 years from the time of Christ is through the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the triunity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. God, El, in the Hebrew word, Yahweh, the Lord, or Jesus, and then the Lord of hosts. Notice the Lord of hosts, Nahum, and Nineveh's cons consumption. Now, the difference between devastation and consumption is devastation just stays there. Devastation just stays there. And it doesn't go anywhere. And we realize that we're living in devastation. It just stays there. Consumption means that ultimately it's going to be consuming. And let me say to you, do not, if you're a Christian today, hear me closely. Do not let your burdens or your troubles consume you. And if you're a Christian today, do not allow unconfessed, unrepented of sin consume you. And let me challenge you, Christian men and women, do not be consumed by the unconfessed, unrepented sins of others. Do not allow the devastator or the devastation to consume you or to consume us as God's people, because we know one day, because of the power of the resurrection, we will rise above it all. Say that with me. We will rise above it all. I don't care if you're in sin or sickness. 
and sin nature has gotten the best of you, or you're dealing with sorrow, you're dealing with separation, one day we will rise above it all. Isn't that good news? Say that with me. One day we will rise above it all. Take a good look at yourself in whatever situation you find yourself in right now and say, I'm going to rise above it all. I'm going to rise above it all in the power of the resurrection. And so please notice that unlike chapter 1 and chapter 2 and verse 2, we do not see the picture of God yet, but we do see it in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15. So the last part of the outline is the Lord of hosts, Nahum and Nineveh's consumption, Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Okay, so in chapter 1, please notice that you have 15 verses, chapter 2, 13 verses, and chapter 3, 19 verses. And so imagine that, but look with me please in verse 15, Nahum chapter 3, verse 15. There fire will consume you, the sword will cut you down, it will consume you as the locust does. Now fire is the picture of the judgment of God. The sword is the picture of the word of God. Now let me help us to all think about this clearly. And logically, I like the word logic. I want us to be on the same logic. Number one, I want to be on the same logic with God. Let me say to you, all of our burdens, all of our devastation comes when we're not on the same logic with God and we're not on the same logic with the people around us. And let me say to you that the word logic in the Greek New Testament comes from the Greek title for Christ in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Logos, or God, or the Word, excuse me. In the beginning was the Logos, or the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word is God. Logos is God. And God's logic is, comes to us through Jesus Christ. He speaks it. He gave them the words. They wrote them. Nahum listened to God, and because of that... We see that judgment is going to come. I'm not afraid of judgment because I'm saved. And I know Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. And I know that I'm not going to be condemned. Now, in that same judgment, God allows me to discern. And we've talked about that. We're not going to talk about it tonight. But notice in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15, we talk about judgment. And the fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. The word the word of God will cut me, and the word of God will cut you, and the word of God will cut the enemies of God. One way or the other, the word is going to cut. So fire equals judgment. The sword equals the word. Fire equals judgment. The sword equals the word. And so when I'm dealing with burdens, when I'm dealing with trouble. When I'm dealing with what I refer to as the anger or the judgment of God falling upon us and the people around us, I am comforted, just as Nahum was, through God's word. God had given Nahum a word through the burdens of Nineveh. God had given Nahum a word through the troubles of Nineveh, through the devastation of Nineveh. God had given him a word through the Lord of host, he could hear God. And because he could hear God's word, he could feel God's word. You know why? Because he was filled, F-I-L-L-E-D, with God. Judgment and the sword. Fire and the sword. Judgment and the word of God. The word of God will cut us down. The word of God will will cut us down. That's why the Bible says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so, in your burden, in your trouble, will you run to the Word of God? Recently, on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about Sunday school in the month of September. And this is the last day of September. As we move into October, we're going to talk about homecoming. You do not want to miss this scripture and study on homecoming. But we've been talking about Sunday school. And we learned in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, that we are sanctified by the word of God and prayer. What does that mean? It means that the best thing for me to do about any burden, about any trouble, is to go to the word of God and to pray to God. God, cut with your word. 
Now, I want God's word to cut me down this side of judgment day, okay? I want God's word to cut me down this time of judgment day. It did, he did that in August of 1979 when he saved me. He did it again in October of 1986 when he called me to preach. He did it again in June of 1991 when he called me to marry. He did it for me in my life in 2007, in August of 2007 when he called me to Lifeline. I want God's word to cut me down in a good way. And if I'm outside of God's will and I'm in sin and it's unconfessed, unrepented of sin, God's word will cut me down in judgment negatively. Now, friend, please think about the position that you find yourself in today. If you're burdened, you're troubled, or you're dealing with the burdens and the troubles of somebody else's sin nature, the best thing that we can do is to be sanctified by the word and by prayer. We need God's comfort and God's best provision of comfort. God's best provision of comfort comes through his word and prayer. When we take it to God, when we give it to God, and when we leave it with God. Think about those three words. Take, give, leave. Say it with me. Take, give, leave. Say it one more time. Take, give, leave. Take your burdens and your troubles to God. Not only do you take them, but just as I pick up this glass, you put them in his hand and you give them to him at the cross of Calvary and then you leave them there so that you can live for God. Live for God. Judgment, the word of God. Judgment, the word of God. Fire, sword, judgment, word. Fire, sword, judgment, word. Take, give, leave. If you're a Christian today and you've been burdened or troubled, or you're dealing with a burden or trouble in your own life, take it to Jesus, give it to him, and leave it there. Do not be like a dog going back to his vomit. Don't pick it back up. That's nasty. And if you're not a Christian, you're not a Christian. Right now, ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Pray a prayer like this. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I'm a sinner. Save me from my sin. Turn me from my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Let me take everything to the cross. Let me give it all to you. Let me leave it there. Be the Lord or the boss of my life from this day on, as it says in Romans 10, 9. And as it says in Romans 10, 9, I believe that God raised you from the dead, giving me resurrection power to take it to the cross, to give it to Jesus at the cross, and to leave it there spiritually, physically, and mentally. Save me right now. <clears throat> and if you prayed that prayer, that's the greatest decision you will ever make. Please let us know. We want to rejoice with you, and we want to grow you. We want to get you a copy of God's Word. We want to help you to be discipled by Jesus Christ and through his word and prayer. Contact us, please. Our number is 501-568-5433. You can reach me at my cell, 501-529-2324. Take, give, leave. Take, give, leave. May God bless you. I hope to see you Sunday, even if you're going to just come and pray with us. Please be here Sunday, even for that prayer time at 1015. We're going to worship safely. And we are praying for you and praying for those that are sick. Have a good, godly week.